Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with a lecture on the digestive system, specifically the small intestine. In this lecture, I'll talk about the gross anatomy of the small intestine, as well as its histological features, the different tissues found in the small intestine, and then finally, uh, a functional overview, things that the small intestine does for the digestive system. The picture that you're looking at on this introductory slide is a picture of the lining or mucosa of the small intestine. And all the little balloon-like bumps that you see are called villi. And you also can see an opening into kind of a tunnel. It's lighter colored. And that's called an intestinal crypt. And we'll talk about what those features do um, in the small intestine as, as I proceed. So the small intestine extends from the pyloric sphincter, which is between the stomach and the small intestine, and the um, ileocecal valve or sphincter, either one, um, at the very end of the small intestine where it connects to the large intestine. The length of the small intestine is pretty long, between two and four meters. Think of a meter as a yard. A meter is a little longer, but nonetheless. And it's called small not for its length, but because its diameter is smaller than the diameter of the large intestine. The diameter of the small intestine is about two and a half centimeters as opposed to the large intestine, which has a diameter more than twice that, almost three times that, seven centimeters. So I kind of drew the scale over here so you can see the difference. Now there's three regions of the small intestine <clears throat> that vary functionally a little bit, but we're just going to look at anatomy here. So the first region of the small intestine is about 10 inches long, and it's called the duodenum or the duodenum, either one, and it's purple in this picture. And the jejunum is the second or middle portion of the small intestine, and it's about eight feet long, two and a half meters. Um, which is equivalent to two and a half meters. And it's blue in this picture. And then the most distal portion of the small intestine is called the ileum. Note its spelling. It's I-L-E versus I-L-I. That would be the bone, the ileum. So this ileum with an E is 12 feet long, which is equivalent to 3.6 meters. Now the histology of the small intestine, we're first going to overview it. It it's, consists of four layers like the rest of the alimentary canal. So the innermost lining is called the mucosa, and that's made up of an epithelial tissue, simple columnar epithelium. And then the submucosa lies superficial to that, and it's composed of loose connective tissue, although there's some in some locations of the the length of the small intestine, you'll find some epithelial cells in here, um, glands that make mucus, and we'll talk about that later. Then the third layer is the muscularis externa, and it's composed of two layers of smooth muscle like most of the digestive tract, except in the stomach, we saw that there were three layers of smooth muscle. And then the most superficial layer is the adventitia, which isn't really shown here. Um, it would be very superficial here. And it's made up of loose connective tissue as well as a simple squamous epithelium. We also can call that adventitia the visceral peritoneum because remember there's always a membrane 
lining all the organs, and that's the visceral layer of the peritoneum, which is located in the abdominal cavity. So let's start by uh, discussing the mucosa layer. Now, I know I said that it's made up of um, epithelial cells, but there are some features that are grosser than that, meaning larger than that. So um, there are circular folds that you can see visibly with the naked eye, and these folds cause the chyme to spiral and mix as it passes through the small intestine. And then the epithelia are arranged in such a way that there are these protrusions. They're pretty small. You have to look at a microscope to see them into the lumen, protrusions into the lumen. And these are called villi. And they increase the surface area available for absorption because it's the small intestine where nutrient absorption takes place. There are also some further extensions of epithelial cell membranes called microvilli, and they also increase the surface area for absorption. So we've already got, you know, two different. Um, structures in the mucosa that enhance absorption. And then there are also these intestinal crypts, um, kind of like pits, I guess, but they're not gastric pits, but they're called intestinal crypts. And they secrete intestinal juice, and we'll look at those. And then in between the epithelial cells lining the mucosa are tight junctions, and that prevents any leakage of nutrients in between the epithelial cells. Instead, nutrients have to be absorbed across the surface of the cell through its cytoplasm and then out the basal surface, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of that. And then finally, the epithelial cells making up the lining of the mucosa have enzymes on their membranes. So we would call them membrane-bound enzymes. And because the um, lining of the mucosa has these microvilli extensions, we often, it looks like a, a brush or a comb can try to draw a picture here like this. It ends up looking like a shadow, really. But if that's my cell, and here's the nucleus, this region has little tiny microvilli on it, and that's where we find these enzymes. They're called brush border enzymes because this part looks like a brush or a comb. And these enzymes are able to do some chemical digestion. They break down carbohydrate or protein, depending on which enzyme um, we're talking about. So now we're going to go through each one of these features of the mucosa so you can see what they look like versus just this list of what they do. So I'll start with the circular folds in the small intestine. And as I mentioned, if we were to cut open the small intestine, either in the cat or human, you would see these obvious ridges, and those are folds of the mucosal lining. Okay, And it, it causes spiraling of chyme, as I mentioned before. And the reason that's important is because it slows the movement of the chyme and that maximizes nutrient absorption. And it also maximizes um, the little chemical digestion that does occur in the small intestine. Well, actually quite a bit does, but it refreshes the part of the chyme that's in um, contact with these brush border enzymes. So it kind of refreshes um, what's touching the mucosa. Uh, 
Okay, now if we were to put the lining of those um, folds under the microscope, we would see that they are composed of even more folding. And um, these folds or protrusions into the lumen are called villi. And um, this is a villus that I've circled over here in black. And I've got five arrows pointing to individual villi. Each one is called a villus, each projection. And I've um, magnified the one that I circled here in black in the picture on the right so that you can see what a single villus looks like. So notice that there's simple columnar epithelium lining this entire villus. And then more interior, there's a core. And in this core is some connective tissue referred to as the lamina propria. But what's most important to us is that this is where blood vessels, capillaries, are located. I should actually use a different picture so they look like blood vessels. I'll use blue for venous capillaries. And then, of course, there's lacteals in here as well for the absorbed fats, um, lipids, triglycerides, and cholesterol specifically. And so the vessels that are located in this core will carry the nutrients either to the bloodstream or the lymphatic system. Now what we're going to do is look at, we're going to magnify even further this epithelial layer and look for microvilli. So first is the picture on the left. This is a single villus. It's made with a scanning electron microscope so that it looks very three-dimensional. And of course, it's been color enhanced. But the red is the simple columnar epithelium. And I guess orange-brown in the middle is the core. So if we take this box, the black box, right here, and we magnify it, you're going to see many epithelial cells, columnar epithelial cells, interspersed with some goblet cells. So I'm going to show you um, individual cells here on the right in the magnified picture. Here's a columnar cell. Here's a columnar cell, another membrane I can see. And the nuclei are all together. Even the goblet cell has a nucleus, but I mean, they're all located in a row. Those, those nuclei always look like they're in a row. And if I go back to the previous slide, you'll see what I mean. <clears throat> Notice this dark purple line in the villus. That is the um, row of nuclei of the columnar epithelial cells. So, not only do we have increased surface area because of this curving of the villus, we also have on each individual epithelial cell little extensions of the cell membrane. That's the brush border right here. This is the brush border. It looks soft and velvety, and that's where the brush border enzymes are located. And in order for those enzymes to break down a nutrient, the nutrient has to make contact directly with the um, brush border. So the nutrient would have to come in close contact, get broken down, and then the products would go back into the lumen. And absorption is going to occur across the microvilli and through the epithelial cell all the way to that core. So the nutrients will cross and go into the vessels that are located in that core. So the microvilli, the main purpose 
I guess there's two, but one is increasing the surface area for absorption. The second is that they contain, the microvilli contain the enzymes to help with digestion. This is the picture that you have in your textbook showing the individual cells and the microvilli. So um, the picture on the left is showing you individual villi, these big bumps. You still need a microscope to see them, but maybe only at a magnification of 20 times. But if you take just the lining of one of the villi, like this right here, and you enhance it, magnify it, you'll see that each columnar cell has a membrane and cytoplasmic extensions increasing the surface area. So that's, those are called microvilli, those individual extensions. In addition to having villi that increase the surface area, the mucosa is also arranged so that there are like pits or divots. Technically, these are called crypts. And there's a certain function of the cells that are located in the crypts. Uh, mainly, they make intestinal juice, which we'll come back to. And in between the indiv individual epithelial cells are tight junctions. So nothing can get in between cells. Instead, any nutrient that's going to be absorbed will have to go through the cytoplasm of the cell. So from the lumen, let's just say it's a little, uh, very tiny monosaccharide like glucose, it has to cross the cell membrane and be processed inside the cell and come out the basal layer of the cell so that it can reach the core vessels in the, um, the core of the villus. Okay, let's look at the cell types that we find in the epithelium, the simple columnar epithelium. The majority of the cells are called enterocytes. Entero basically means gut, site means cell. So most of the cells you'll see are pink and I made the word pink so that it lines up. And um, they're located in both, you know, the villus or the villi that protrude into the lumen as well as down into the crypts. So they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And those are the ones that contain those microvilli and membrane-bound enzymes or brush border enzymes. Okay. Now, in the intestinal crypts, you don't usually get the nutrients coming down into the crypts. So um, the enterocytes down in the crypts, the pink cells, they're making um, intestinal juice, which is largely water with some electrolytes and mucus. We'll talk about that again later. Interspersed between the majority of these enterocytes are goblet cells, and they're shown as purple. And the goblet cells sometimes have microvilli, sometimes they don't. That's not really what's important. Um, what's important is that they make mucus, and mucus is alkaline. And you really need that alkaline mucus to neutralize the acidic chyme that came from the stomach. Also present in both the villi and the um, intestinal crypts are these endocrine cells. They're special endocrine cells. They're called enteroendocrine cells. I guess because, you know, they're not in an endocrine organ, like a gland, like thyroid gland. You know, they're in, a, in the gut here. And they make hormones, though, just like any endocrine cell. And, and remember that hormones travel in the blood. So 
the hormones are going to have to be released from the basal surface of the cell to reach the blood. Some examples of um, endocrine cells that we've already talked about that are made in the duodenal portion of the small intestine in the duodenum are secretin and cholecystokinin. And we'll, we'll talk about that again next week. So those three cell types, the enterocytes and the goblet cells and the enteroendocrine cells, are found in both the villi and the crypts. But there are two types of cells only found in the crypts, the intestinal crypts. These are the panath cells, which are yellow. You can see they're not very numerous. And stem cells, which aren't even labeled in this diagram. So I made them black, the word black, I don't know. So panath cells are the immune cells of the small intestine. They secrete chemicals called defensins and lysozyme that can kill bacteria. And so it helps um, kind of maintain the appropriate bacterial flora of the gut. You need some bacteria in your gut, of course. Um, it helps with digestion. But the defensins and lysozyme will get rid of path pathogenic bacteria. And because the lining of the intestine is constantly, um, I guess, being abraded and, with a fluid that's flowing through it, and it also contracts the small intestine, and so um, the fluid or the chyme gets pushed up against the mucosa, you can imagine that the epithelial cells get damaged over time. And so the stem cells help replenish those epithelial cells. And they're typically only found in the crypts, um, which is a little bit interesting. I'm not sure how after mitosis the cells move upwards, but I assume it's a little bit like the skin in the sense that you had one cell and then you have two cells, so everything sort of gets pushed up. That's how it works in the skin. So. Okay, I wanted to show you what I'm talking about with the brush border enzymes just a little bit, not a lot of chemistry here. But you know that these are the microvilli and that there are enzymes somewhere in there. So I decided to draw a shape representing an enzyme. It's a blue triangle. And that enzyme stays adhered to the membrane of the cell. The only way it's going to perform or catalyze a chemical reaction is for the substrate of the enzyme to come in contact with it. So here I've got a very small uh, like carbohydrate, like maltose. It's a disaccharide. And it has to be, you know, sort of flung against that brush border to come in contact with that enzyme. And that happens due to spiraling and contraction of the muscle in the small intestine. Once it hits that enzyme or comes in contact with it, the enzyme catalyzes the breakdown. And so now you have two individual smaller molecules, each of which are glucose. And now those smaller molecules are what will be absorbed across the microvilli and all the way out the basal surface of the cell to reach the blood. So the purpose of the brush border enzymes or the membrane bound enzymes are to break down small molecules into individual monomers like amino acids and glucose. Um, and um, the other important thing to remember, of course, is the nutrient or the simple molecule has to come into direct contact with the intestinal mucosa for that to happen. Okay, that takes care of the mucosa. That's the majority of all the adaptations in the small intestine. Now we're going to look at 
the submucosa, the next layer, deep layer, one layer deep. So in the submucosa, and I'm going to show you this is the duodenum mucosa here. So I'm sorry, submucosa. This is the jejunum submucosa. And here is the ileum submucosa. And you're like, mm, I'm never going to be able to tell the difference. And you don't have to. You'll never be tested with this picture. But you do need to know that in the duodenum, the submucosa has some um, special features or a special feature called the Brunner's glands, sometimes called duodenal glands, and they secrete mucus. So in the duodenum, it's really important to neutralize that chyme, very first part of the small intestine, and so we have even more mucus production by these glands. And since they're glands secreting something, they're composed of epithelial tissue. They can also, con that mucus also contributes just in general to the intestinal juice that mixes with the chyme in the lumen. The jejunum, there's nothing really special about the submucosa at all, so I'm just sort of going to skip that. It's just connective tissue. But in the ileum, the submucosa has aggregates of um, lymphocytes and they're formed these aggregates we call lymphoid nodules and you can see the circles I've got white arrows pointing to them um, you can see the circles or lymphoid nodules um, containing the lymphocytes here and here and again there's um, the ability to f to uh, fight bacterial pathogenic bacterial microorganisms by secreting antibodies, natural killer cells. There's a lot of different lymphocytes in there and it helps maintain the normal bacterial flora in the ileum as well. Um, anyway, these nodules are called Peyer's patches. So they're important for immunity in the gut. Now let's look a little bit at the um, the villi core, which makes it, it's part of the submucosa, really. So the submucosa has um, loose connective tissue, and sometimes those Brunner's glands are in there, and, and sometimes the um, Peyer's patches are in there. But well, let's just pretend we're in the jejunum because it's the simplest. So here's the submucosa underneath the epithelium, right? And what's important is what is in this villus core right here, right here, this part. Because there's three types of vessels, I guess you could say, or two. There's cap blood capillaries, both you know, the arterial end of a capillary and then the venous end. And there are vessels called lacteals, which are lymphatic vessels. And so what do all these do? Well, the arterial capillary or arterial end of a capillary bed is bringing in oxygen-rich blood just to supply the small intestine with oxygen so that it can perform um, ATP synthesis and, and anything else that's oxygen dependent. The venous blood is going to carry away or drain blood that's dropped off oxygen, but in addition, this venous blood is going to be nutrient rich because all these nutrients have crossed from the lumen and now can enter the uh, venous end of the capillary and that blood will flow obviously back to the heart but first it's going to go through the hepatic portal vein this vein that's here will link up to a vein that goes to the liver first and so the liver has the first shot at getting all the nutrients from the liver
the blood will go back to the heart in the inferior vena cava. And the lacteals also are carrying lymph away from the small intestine, interstitial fluid away from the small intestine, and the lacteals will eventually travel all the way up to the, I guess it's on the other side, the right side, the left side, but all the way up to the thoracic duct, which leads to the subclavian vein. But the important thing here is that the lacteals are needed to transport any absorbed triglycerides or cholesterol. And we'll study this again, but you have carbohydrates coming across, you have proteins coming across, and then you have lipids coming across to enter these vessels. Carbohydrates and proteins will both enter the blood. So carbohydrate and protein-rich blood will travel in the blood capillaries, right, of course. And then the fats travel in the lymphatic vessels, the triglycerides and cholesterol. Okay, now let's look at what those enterocytes and goblet cells do for us, what they make. They make intestinal juice, which gets mixed with the chyme. And of course, the panath cells that are making any kind of um, lysozyme, that'll get put into the intestinal juice as well. So this intestinal juice enters the lumen, mixes with the chyme, and the submucosal duodenal glands where they exist will contribute. And since there's so much mucus from both the duodenal glands and the goblet cells, the pH is very alkaline. It's between, well, not very, but it's alkaline. Compared to the stomach pH, if you remember, was well below 3. So we need to neutralize that. And this alkaline, music, mu, um, alkaline mucus and intestinal juice has a pH of about 7.4 to 7.5. So what's in the intestinal juice besides mucus? Well, there's water. There's bicarbonate ion, which will um, bind to any hydrogen ions. And then, of course, defensins and lysozyme from the panath cells. Now, unlike the stomach, the juice made in the small intestine does not contain any enzymes. There are no enzymes secreted into the lumen of the small intestine. The only enzymes that are present in the small intestine and made by the small intestine stay on those cell membranes. So the intestinal juice itself does not have any nutrient digesting enzymes. So the biggest function of intestinal juice is just to neutralize the chyme, the acidity of the chyme, and fight any foodborne infection. That's all. Okay, the last thing to talk about is just to review the functions of the small intestine, which we're, we're going to look at in much more detail um, in week nine. So we know, because we just talked about it, that the small intestine secretes intestinal juice in order to neutralize the chyme, which I suppose actually also protects the mucosa so that it's not too acidic, breaking down cells. And the second thing is that there's some mechanical digestion that takes place in the small intestine, but not nearly as much as occurs in the stomach. Some of this mechanical digestion is due to the presence of those circular folds causing the spiraling of the chyme. But also, we'll see that the small intestine actually constricts in regions contract when the smooth muscle contracts. And so um, we just call that motility for now. Motility meaning muscular contraction. We get a little bit of mechanical digestion.
In addition, the small intestine is where we absorb all of our nutrients except for the little bit of water that we absorbed in the stomach. So absorption takes place in the small intestine. And chemical digestion does take place, the majority of chemical digestion takes place in the small intestine as well. Now that might sound um, like the opposite of what I just told you, that there's no enzymes in the intestinal juice, but that's because, um, I'm sorry, but still the most chemical digestion takes place in the small intestine because the liver and the pancreas make enzymes that they, they secrete into or release into the small intestine. So pancreatic juice and bile will be the um, compounds that do the chemical digestion in the small intestine not the intestinal juice. We'll come back to that again in week nine. But of course there are some brush border enzymes that account for making the smallest possible molecules from the nutrients that get into the small intestine. And then finally the other function of the small intestine is just to propel the chyme, which is slowly turning into waste because we're absorbing all the good stuff, so propelling the contents, which will eventually become feces. Okay, that's our introduction, histology, gross anatomy, and an overview of function of the small intestine. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great spring break.